Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, uh, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. All right, well, uh, before we do get started, I want to encourage you I to check out uh, johnnydollarair.com when you make your travel plans. johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline uh, affiliate, so you can uh, either name your own price or choose from some great published fares. The good thing about going through johnnydollarair.com is part of your purchase price goes to support the great detectives of old time radio. So when you're making your travel plans and comparing between different websites, remember just to go to johnnydollarair.com first. All right, well now it's time to to wrap up today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and then afterwards, Dr. Tim returns. But here now is the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope Matter, Part 5. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ronald Kenworthy, Mr. Dollar. Good, I want to talk to you. Are you at your home? I am. And after the Okay, you... then stay right there and I'll be over to see you. Why don't you send the police instead? What's that supposed to mean? A few minutes ago in Mrs. Van Pyten's library, before you kicked me out, you practically accused me of the murder of her nephew. Did I? Well, didn't you? Didn't you? All right, Ronnie, just calm down and stay put until I can get over there. <laughs> you mean you aren't afraid I might try to take a powder, as you high-handed detectives like to put it? You mean you aren't worried that... Ah. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is the final report in my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heather's Scope Matter. The whole case started out almost as a lark when I discovered that I'd come to Philadelphia to act as bodyguard to Laird Douglas Douglas and for a fat fee and virtually unlimited expense accounts. Me, bodyguard to a dog. But it ceased to be funny when I learned that the dog's two previous caretakers had been murdered. And when, only a few hours ago, an attempt was made on my life, that ended with the death of young Warren Staley. Yes, Mr. Dollar, I see. I guess I was so upset by the death of my nephew that I I didn't realize the attempt was really made on your life. The second attempt, Mrs. Van Pyten. What? Shortly after I arrived in Philadelphia, somebody planted a booby trap in my suitcase in my hotel room. Good heavens, no. And you think that Ronald Kenworthy did that, too? Well, what do you think? Well, yes... Now that poor dear Warren is gone, there's nothing to prevent the Kenworthy estate from achieving control of the Van Pyten holdings. That is, if I were to die. Go on. Upon the death of Harrison Kenworthy, the whole financial empire would be inherited by his son, Ronald. So I understand. Ronald. And he would be the wealthiest, the most powerful man financially in the United States. Ronald, who pretended to be Warren's best friend who pretended to love me. It's a terrible thought, isn't it? Apparently adds up, though, doesn't it? There is no question of it. But what evidence have you? None yet. Well, then I'll help you get it. And I can do it, Mr. Dollar. I may appear to be only a wealthy, foolish old woman who dotes on her pet, Laird Douglas. But I'm not. I'm astute, shrewd, and clever. Since Peter, my husband, died, I alone have managed this estate, this financial empire. I use the word again. With my money, with my... Oh, yes, I can do it, Mr. Dollar, and Ronald will be made to pay for these terrible things that he has done. I, uh, 
I admire your confidence. Nothing. No one can stand in my way. You see, I'm only sorry that a few minutes ago you didn't keep him here and make him face it. I'm going to see him now. Oh, where? At his home. I understand the estate adjoins this one. Yes. But please, look out for him. Shoot first, Mr. Dollar. What? Because now he may act like the cornered rat that he is. I decided to walk across to the Kenworthy estate in the hope the fresh air would help clear my thoughts. Logical as it all seemed, I didn't like what I just heard. Then luck, pure, unadulterated luck. As I walked across the broad lawn between the main house and the gatehouse, I passed the garage building with its Rolls Royce, two Cadillacs, and a station wagon. And then I saw him. Andy LaFord, alias Andrew Fortune, alias Andrew Ford, one of the cleverest second-story men in the country, with a record on the West Coast as long as your arm. A man who would do anything for money. He was idly going through the motion of dusting off a car. I walked past quickly, not sure whether he'd notice me or not. I hope not. For it was one of his ilk who'd had to plant the booby trap in my hotel room, who could have slipped the poison into the liquor that killed Warren Staley. I turned in at the gatekeeper's house. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I saw you at the question. I want to telephone, quick. Uh, well, you're uh, right here, sir. Is something Thanks. wrong? Thanks. Operator, get me central police emergency. Good heavens, Mr. Dollar. Something the else The man there happened? in the garage, polishing cars. Uh, Andy? How long has he been here? Oh, a year more. Ever since the dog show at Valley Kid. Well, what does he do? Year. Oh, the driving for Mrs. Van Payton, but there's something gone... Hello? To... Give me Lieutenant Howard, homicide. After warning the old gatekeeper that I'd have his head if he said anything to anyone about my phone call, I left by the back door and went over to the Kenworthy mansion where young Ronald was waiting for me. I must say, before we go any further, that I resent the way you ordered me out of the Van Pyten house a few minutes ago. Yeah? Well, I'm sorry. Whether you suspect me or expect me to help you in this case, it was hardly... Lonnie, you knew Warren Staley. Very well. We were the closest of friends. Confidence. All right. Just how much did he really care about the Van Pyten estate? Fortune, whatever you want to call it. To put it bluntly, he wanted none of it. And I'm afraid his aunt rather resented it. Why do you say that? Because her whole life she's been obsessed by an almost overwhelming lust for power. When Warren finally rebelled against this, she tried not to show it, but she hated him for it. Unlike my father. Oh? I feel as Warren felt. And my father and I together have been laying the groundwork for dissipating the Kenworthy estate into corporate setups that will benefit many instead of just us. Does that sound strange to you? It sounds like true philanthropy, if you mean it. You must believe me, it is, and I do mean it. Oh, I won't suffer, of course. I'll still retain some control here and there, but I'll have to work at it instead of just carrying on the tradition of the idle rich. I'll be a man. I hope you're telling me the truth, Ronnie. I believe you are, and I'd like to meet your father. You will. Needless to say, it was much harder for him to break from this tradition of financial power than for me. So perhaps you can see why I admire him above all other men. Anything else? I'll see you later. I was worried about you, Mr. Dollar, going over there to see Ronald Kenworthy alone after all that has happened. Yes, you should have been, Mrs. Van Pyten. Especially if you noticed that I passed by the garage on the way. What? I happened to notice someone there, and I think it answered a lot of questions for me. It was Andy LaForte. Andrew? My private chauffeur? Is that all he is? Oh, do you know him, Mr. Dollar? Look... I took on this case, Mrs. Van Pyten, because you offered me a fee too good to be turned down and an almost unlimited expense account. You haven't answered my... I should have got wise then and there. But I thought your great passion for your dog was just an amusing foible of an immensely wealthy, kind of foolish old lady. Oh, Laird Douglas is a dear one, isn't he? Why, Mr. Dollar... Let me add things up. A few minutes ago, you told me that thanks to your wealth and a very sharp, clever mind, you'd let nothing stand in the way of anything you chose to do. Please, Mr. Dollar, I don't think I understand. All right. You made a contract with Harrison Kenworthy that you'd marry him when and if Laird Douglas beat that pup of his at the dog show. An apparently silly sort of thing, yet everybody believed it. But the real reason for marriage to him was solely to acquire control of his holdings, increase this financial empire of yours. Very subtle. 
Kept you looking like a cute, whimsical old lady. Why, this is the most absurd thing I ever heard of. So I thought at first, but let me go on. Oh, please do. When you realized that Laird Douglas wasn't ready to beat that dog of his, rather than admit defeat, rather than lose the chance to make this marriage, you ordered the murder of the dog's handlers. Then the contract was still in force, just delayed. I won't listen to such terrible things. You'll listen whether you like it or not. You learned that Kenworthy and his son were planning to dissipate their fortune and thereby put it beyond your reach. Mr. Dollar... On top of this, your own nephew, Warren, wanted to do the same with your estate. This was too much. What you have said is too much. Then, by the time I arrive, you learned from an expert, Ray Rowland, that your dog would never stand a chance against Kenworthy's. So you wouldn't dare let him compete, at least until you'd hooked Kenworthy some other way. And part of your whole scheme was to build up evidence of attempts against you, through the dog, of course, though I'll bet you actually hate the mutt. No, that's not true. Anyhow, from the moment I talked to Ray Rowland, I was only in the way. So you tried to get rid of me. Had somebody booby-trap my luggage. Oh, you have no proof. Andy Laforte, this so-called chauffeur of yours, would do anything for money. And I fully intend to break him down and make him admit you hired him as a killer. Listen. Listen to me. On the second try, the poison liquor, your nephew Warren got it instead of me. Fine, fine. Another obstacle out of your way. After all, he had opposed you. Mr. Dollar, how much do you want? I can make you financially independent. Then you the set your sights on Ronald Kenworthy, who was trying to break up the other empire you wanted to get your hands on. You even hoped that somehow I might help you. Shoot first, you said. You don't understand. I was Just only... what plans you had for his old man and that warped, twisted brain of yours, I don't know. But I'm sure you had plans. Well, lady, now it's too late. No, Mr. Dollar. No, it isn't too late. Stay away from that drawer. You'd even shoot somebody down with your own hand if you thought it necessary, wouldn't you? But it isn't necessary, Mr. Dollar. Huh? Are you sure it wouldn't be easier if I were just to give you... Say, a hundred thousand dollars and two hundred thousand. All right, Andrew. Right here, Mrs. Van Pyten. Well, well. Hello, Andy. Got a license for that thing? Shut up. You want me to do it now, Mrs. Van? Yes, Andrew. Uh, what if the servants hit a shot? Hold it, Donna. Don't worry, Andrew. I'll take care of things. Haven't I always for you? Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. She'll take care of things. While you're pulling that trigger, she'll blast you down so fast you won't know what hit you. Make it look like we killed each other and leave her in the clear. Quiet. She's got a gun in that drawer beside her and she'll use it. You hear me, Eddie? I said quiet. What you don't know is that she can't do without me. <laughs> but we can do without you. All right, Andy, wait now. Listen, will now, you? Now, Mrs. Van. All right, Andrew. Now. Thanks, Lieutenant. Oh, Lieutenant. Then you saw he was going to shoot down Mr. Dollar. Yes, I oh, heard, yes. too, Mrs. Van Pyten. Plenty. Oh, no, you, you don't understand. Mr. Dollar had come up here to talk to me. I wanted to offer him a great deal more money for his work for me. I guess didn't I almost I, didn't Dollar, make it. Glad you keep talking to him so then long. This Got a cough drop. Is this body the end of the fortune? Oh, and shut the... up. What was that? You heard him. I beg your pardon. Clever, shrewd, astute. You're just off your rocker. You'd have to be, I guess, to start a thing like this in the first place. Well, I guess by the time the estate and inheritance laws get properly applied, the Van Pyten Empire will be spread around the way Warren wanted it. Expense account item 10, $28.90. Fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Total, including fees, $1,113.40. Remarks? I'm glad I'm poor. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, an insurance swindle that really backfired. The only trouble was it caught me right in the line of fire. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in our cast were Jeanette Nolan, Harry Bartell, Byron Kane, Jack Crucian, Bill James, James McCallion, Ken Christie, Dick Ryan, Bert Holland, Jack Edwards, and High Everback. 
Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Well, I, I told Tim that the scripts were getting better, and I think this was definitely a better episode than the last couple of uh, John Stone stories we've heard. Um, uh, th- this was not the expected uh, result, uh, though he did kind of tip his hand a little bit towards the end. Um, with her basically uh, suggesting that they would... Uh, uh, support uh, k- uh, sh- shooting down the uh, guy who was the son of the other family. So, uh, but other than that, I, I thought this was uh, an interesting episode, even though it had that really kind of bizarre tone issue, uh, where Sirius, the first two, uh, the last three episodes after being really a, a comic episode, the first two. Uh, but, uh, at any rate, uh, let's go ahead and take a listen now to Dr. Tim Detective. And today's story is The Case of the Dog Who Did and Didn't. Dr. Tim Detective, to bring you by transcription, The Mystery of the Dog That Did and Didn't. <laughs> It had been a tiring week, and as I washed up after some experiments I'd been making to determine whether a certain murder case had involved the use of poison, I thought what a swell day it would be for a picnic in the mountains. It was early in November, and from my laboratory window, the mountains looked as if they'd been sprinkled with powdered sugar. I'll get Sandy and Jill, I told myself, and we'll make this a Saturday to remember. You see, Jill's my landlady's daughter, and Sandy lives up the street a ways. They've both been mighty useful from time to time in helping me to solve some mysteries. I turned off the water, dried my hands, and started to go out into the hall to call Jill and Sandy when the phone rang. Hello, Tim? Yes? Jarvis speaking. I've got a case that looks right up your alley. I sighed. There, I thought, goes my holiday in the mountains. Because whenever my old friend Dr. Jarvis calls, it's sure to be a case of more than ordinary interest. Jarvis works for the health department, and I've been consulted by him on problems before. He continued. Yes, it's right in your neighborhood, too. They've just taken a woman to the hospital, and there's no doubt about it. She has Rocky Mountain spotted fever. What? In November? Interested, huh? But the tick season's been over since, well, the middle of the summer. Well, you can examine the woman yourself if you want to, but three doctors, including myself, have made the diagnosis, and it can't be wrong. Severe chills, followed by a fever of 104 or 5, pain in the muscles and joints, and get this, the spotting of the skin has already started this morning. But where do I come in? Well, you and I know there's one cause and one cause only for the spotted fever. Ticks. She's been bitten by an infected tick and recently. But as you say, the tick season has been over for several months now. Why don't you go over to the house? Now, oh, look, Jarvis, what makes you think I'm the one? Well, you're supposed to be good at that sort of thing. Oh, okay. But don't expect any results. Spotted fever in the winter. This plane doesn't make sense, that's all. Now, give me that name and address. Slipping 
on my top coat, I tried to make sense of the puzzle. The address was that of Mr. Herman May, just around the corner from me. I recognized the name. There was a Willie May, a few years older than Jill and Sandy, who played with him sometimes. And speaking of Sandy and Jill, it was curious, I thought, that I hadn't seen anything of them this morning. Usually on Saturdays, they'd be clamoring at my door. Well, I needn't wonder any longer. I called, come in! Like a freak, a yapping white dog ran between my legs, jumped up and down in greeting, and then dashed around and around my laboratory, barking and sniffing in great excitement. Sandy and Jill followed the dog into the room more slowly, but obviously bursting with excitement. Tiny, Tiny, here, Tiny. Come back here this instant. Oh, gee, I'm sorry, Dr. Chuck. I was carrying him and he got away. Come here, Tiny. The little ball of fur, silent now, came dancing into the laboratory from my adjoining bedroom. I blush to admit that my bachelor housekeeping isn't all it should be. The dog proved that. For two days I'd been looking for that particular sock the dog carried in his mouth. It uh, must have been under the bed. Put it down, sir. Put it down at once. The dog dropped the sock and wagged his tail nearly off. Honest, I'm awful sorry, Dr. Tim. He belongs to Willie May and his mother's in the hospital. You and... mean the dog's mother? Don't be ridiculous. I mean Willie's mother and she has something awful. I forget what it's called. And... It's called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And it's caused by the bite of a tick. Despite its name, the disease is found in almost every state of the Union. Only funny thing is, there aren't supposed to be any ticks around during the cold season. Good gosh. How did you find out? About Mrs. May, I mean. Detectives know everything, Sandy. Hey, how bet I saw on. Dr. Timson called in on the case already. And you can't keep us out of it because Willie May asked us to take care of his dog for him while he's staying over at his aunt. Because Mr. May's working and can't get off and he left the key with us so the doctor who's going to investigate can get in. And all the time it was you, Dr. Tim. And, and what are we waiting for? Let's get going. A few moments later, we unlocked the door to the May house and went in, silent and pondering. Our equipment consisted of flashlights for peering into dark corners in our search for the presence of another tick or two, which might have accounted for the illness of Mrs. May. Each of us had an envelope and a pair of tweezers so as not to run the risk of crushing an infected tick and getting some of the deadly microbes upon ourselves. After a few joyful homecoming yelps, Tiny disappeared to some secret place of his own. We began the search in earnest. We divided the front room and the adjoining dining room into areas, calling across to each other as we searched for a chance tick that might be hiding. Hey, I don't think I've ever even seen a tick, Dr. Tim. Well, you can't miss one if you find it. They're grayish-brown little bugs. Oh, less than half the size of your little fingernail, which makes them pretty hard to see when they're in their natural setting. Yeah, I know. I found them in rotting logs in the woods. But why does the bite of a tick give you spotted teeth? The bite of most ticks won't. But there's one particular kind of tick. We doctors call it Dermacenter andersoni, which can pass on the disease to human beings. Gee, what a name. But how do the ticks get the fever? Well, they don't, Jill. They only carry the organism that causes it. I wish you'd quit using those words. What the heck's an, an organism? It's an agent which carries a disease, but it's so small that it can't be seen except through a microscope. Yeah, but I still want to know... Well, these ticks bite sheep or squirrels or prairie dogs or coyotes that have the disease, and then they bite people and pass it on to them. They're what we call carriers. They can pass spotted fever on, but don't have it themselves, you see. Just like the mosquitoes that cause malaria. Yeah, exactly. Or like typhoid Mary. We learned about her in school. She gave hundreds of people typhoid after she'd recovered from it herself. Didn't even know she was carrying the disease around. Hey, I found something. Don't touch it. Let me see it. Oh, I thought it was a tick. It's only an old piece of rubber band. Well, kids, we've covered these two rooms thoroughly. We can give them a clean bill of health. Let's move on towards the back of the house. By the time we'd covered the downstairs thoroughly, Sandy and Jill had received an elementary course in Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. They learned that it's mostly in April, May, and June the ticks are active. They were made to realize the necessity for protecting oneself with heavy boots, stockings, gloves, and tightly buttoned shirts before going into areas in the mountains which are known to be full of ticks. They learned that the only way to make sure even then is to have one's body thoroughly inspected each evening before going to bed. I explained how to remove all ticks gently from the skin and to remove them without crushing. They learned that the clothing must be inspected as well, and all danger of ticks hiding there eliminated. Can you 
was a good lesson. But we weren't any further along in our mystery. Just as we finished looking over the downstairs part of the house and the basement, the door opened and Mr. May came in. We introduced ourselves and soon were deep in conference. Now, oh, yes, Dr. Five and your old hunting clothes and a sheepskin jacket that I might have taken into tick country. I don't. I haven't been outside my car in the woods or the mountains for several years. Well, what about the dog? Perhaps he had a... Tiny? No. Tiny's never been on a trip during the year we've had him. Tiny, hearing his name, came joyfully dashing in, bearing as a trophy exactly one half of what looked to be a bedroom slipper. Proudly, he laid it before Mr. May. We all quickly agreed that such a short-haired dog couldn't very well carry ticks without their being easily found. Besides, he'd had no chance to pick them up. There was nothing to do but continue our search. Slowly, we moved upstairs, Mr. May leading the way. Or rather, Tiny leading with all of us following behind. It was in the closet of Mrs. May's room that our first break came in the case. Sandy gave a shout. Look, a tick. Right here on Mrs. May's fur coat. Quickly, we gathered around. I took the coat, laid it on the bed, and then one by one hauled the clothes out of the closet. By the time we were finished, the count was five ticks. Under my magnifying glass, all of them we easily identified as the carrier of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, the wood tick Derma Center Andersoni, in the clothes closet of a house in town months after the tick season was over. Here was a mystery indeed. In fact, in the excitement of our discovery, I overlooked what turned out to be one of the most important clues in the whole case. Tiny, the dog, came bounding into the room with a small box in his mouth. He shook his head back and forth as if he were worrying a bone. Suddenly, the lid of the box flew off, and over the carpet flew out a mess of butterflies, the fruit of some collector's search of the previous summer. Tiny, shame on you. Go away. Here, Dr. Tim, I'll pick them up. And with a farewell to Mr. May and a promise to resume our detective work later, I took the kids out to eat. <laughs> We sat over dessert in a downtown restaurant, with both kids feeding their week's allowance into a jukebox while we discussed the progress of the case. Well, I've got a theory anyway. I think it was murder. Oh, now, sadly. No one's dead in the first place. Now could it even be attempted murder? Not one person in a million would think of scattering wood ticks around a room in the hopes that the right victim would get spotted fever. Oh, I don't know. Perhaps Mr. May hated his wife. Oh, that's complete utter nonsense. What those ticks could have bitten him? Or young Willie? For me. Hey, that reminds me. We looked all over that doggone house, but we didn't remember the secret room in the basement. Secret room? What is this? A Middle Ages thriller? No, oh, it isn't really a secret room. It's really so graphic, Happy Corian. Well, sort of where he keeps his collection, too. Let's have him tell about it. Sure, you go through kind of a winding passage, all painted black. The light won't spoil the pictures will he develop. Oh, let me stop and think a moment. What sort of collection does Master Willie make? Oh, butterflies and bugs and stuff. Well, gee, I'll bet that's where Tiny got that box of first one. Now, hold on a second. You mean the dog can go in and out of that room as he pleases? Sure he can. Well, but you wait, Dr. Jim. What's the connection? I'm not sure. But I think I know how Mrs. May got spotted fever. You kids hop in the car outside and I'll make two phone calls. And maybe I'll come up with the answer. And I did. The first call was to young Willie May at his aunt's house. I asked one question. Willie said, yes, he did collect a lot of miscellaneous insects the summer before. Some of them were ticks. The second call was to a specialist friend of mine who is an authority on the habits of insects. He assured me that certain insects, the wood tick among them, can live in hibernation for months and still have enough life to attach themselves to a human being and cause the disease. It was obvious that Willie's tick collection, scattered around the bedroom by the dog, just as he'd scattered the butterflies, was the solution to the mystery. And it turned out later it was. Sandy and Jill were full of questions, but only one or two were to the point. Well, what about Mrs. May? Will she get well? Well, she has an excellent chance, Jill. 
Spotted fever is often fatal, but one of the new wonder-working drugs is being used in a lot of cases these days. They're using it on her. Gosh, isn't there some kind of stuff like vaccination for spotted fever? There is, but there isn't much reason for anyone to have those inoculations unless he plans to go into places where ticks might reasonably be found. It's not a sure method of preventing spotted fever. Even if used, the injections must be taken six weeks before exposure. Being careful is the only answer. Well, this was your one case where a dog was the carrier of a disease. And yet he wasn't. Not in the usual way. Yeah, the mystery of the dog that did. I puzzled over that one and finally came to a compromise. It's the mystery of the dog that did and didn't. This is Dr. Tim, Detective, saying so long until next week at the same time. When Sandy, Jill, and I will bring you by transcription the mystery of the girl from Singapore. Welcome back. Good uh, educational program. And at the very least, uh, Cindy shows a very active um, imagination <laughs> with his suggestion of uh, murder. Dr. Tim's uh, almost practically saying, what type of show do you think this is? And, uh, Ro- and that actually Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever does continue to remain um, one of the most lethal um, illnesses um, in the United States. So it's definitely messy. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty clever uh, solution here. Obviously, no criminal to uh, track down. But they definitely do what they do uh, pretty well in terms of making uh, these medical uh, science stuff interesting. Well, uh, speaking of that, we have a listener comment from Clarissa who says, Hi, Adam. Love your podcast. I've been enjoying the new Johnny Dollar serials, but missing Sherlock Holmes. I've also liked the few episodes of Dr. Tim, not particularly from a mystery standpoint, but because I think the medical knowledge from the 1940s is really interesting. I was wondering if, uh, uh, do you know if the young girl from Dr. Tim is played by Sandra Gould, possibly best known as the second Gladys Kravitz from Bewitched? It sounds like her to me. Thanks for all the great mysteries. Uh, well, Clarissa, thanks for the question. Uh, I delayed answering on the show just because uh, we didn't have any Dr. Tim episode last week. Um, but my answer is not enlightening. Uh, I just, uh, we don't know. Um, Dr. Tim is one of those shows we have very little information on as to who the players were uh, or where it was even produced. Uh, it may sound like the character, but yeah, there's just no information really available on the series other than the name of the company that uh, produced it, uh, Monarch, um, or syndicated it, Mo- Monarch Program Library Syndication. Other than that, uh, we have no information on it at all. So, uh, uh, and the, that it was released in 1948. So. And what we can say about Gould's career is that she did do some radio, but um, when you get to 1948, uh, she was making appearances on programs like My Friend Irma, uh, The Adventures of Sam Spade, and uh, Faber McGee and Molly, which doesn't uh, totally exclude the possibility of her doing uh, an obscure kids show, but uh, I think her career probably wasn't at that point. Personally, I lean towards this series. Not my best guess is that it didn't even come from Hollywood uh, and was made uh, somewhere else uh, as an educational effort. I could be wrong, but that's just my best guess. So, all right. Well, and if there's anyone out there who has some more information on Doctor Tim Detective, I'd love to hear it. But that'll do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for the lineup. We. Uh, kick off a new uh, Johnny Dollar story on Monday, and Dr. Tim will be back next Friday. Uh, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.